Hey, welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today and for that wonderful prelude heard twice. So good we had to hear it twice. Now, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you. My name is Justin Westmoreland, the pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church. We planted the church, uh, began the process about five years ago almost now, and we look forward to the fall, September 19th, organizing and becoming a particular organized church, moving from mission church to full church. And it is a pleasure that uh, God has called so many of you along with a journey with us, and, and we've had a, a great ride good time and look forward to the best things being ahead of us and that's what the gospel teaches that the best things really are ahead of us uh, there will be an end to sin there will be an end to death there will be an end to all that is uh, revolting against God's lordship and creation and when we worship we get the means of grace to be able to to, to climb to, to be lifted up and climb up and spend some time in the presence of God and to hear his promises with his people uh, and it is so amazing to hear the promises sung and to pray and to, and to enjoy the word of god in community together uh, and to be encouraged in that that it's not you're not alone in this uh, even though you're never alone because god is with you uh, it is more believable and wonderful when we gather together on, on the lord's day and we're thankful for your presence here as it blesses each of us and we pray that you'll be blessed this morning that said, I want to get to our theme today. It's going to be uh, a good one. Our theme is thinking God's thoughts after Him. Now, we're looking at Romans 3, 1 through 8. We're back to Romans this week. We spent two weeks looking at the resurrection of the Creator, Jesus, and the creation, all, of, all things, including our bodies. Now, as we get back into Romans, we go verse by verse through it. We're in a section today that is going to be a little bit of a parenthesis or a diversion to handle objections. And if we don't think according to God's thoughts or his revealed will, his oracles, his scriptures that we know them in the Bible, then we are prone to a lot of foolishness, a lot of errors. And so Paul is going to deal with three of them that vindicate God's faithfulness today. And so we're looking at thinking God's thoughts after him. All right, with that said, I want to get into it this morning. And I want to have a... Uh, uh, there's a lot on your page two of your bulletin that will give you, uh, I think, it's spiritual encouragement. But I want to highlight the last one right now, and that's, that's a, it's one on parenting. And so as we're thinking about shepherding a child's heart and shepherding our own hearts, this is a good reminder for all of us uh, this morning, especially when we're thinking about worship and what we hope to, to receive this morning. So think about this and the way God works. It says, according to Elise Fitzpatrick, and give them grace, and Jessica Thompson says, the one encouragement we can always give to our children and one another is that God is more powerful than our sin. He is strong enough to make us want to do the right thing. We can assure them that his help can reach everyone, even them. Our encouragement should always stimulate praise for God's grace rather than for our goodness. That's what we hope to accomplish this morning, to, to have more and more esteem and joy in God's grace. All right, with that said, I'll ask you to stand with me for the call to worship, which will be responsive with, I'll say the minister part, and I'll say the people part from Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. God's going to get the last, the first word and last word today from Hebrews 10. It says, Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over this house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us pray. How wonderful it is to be clean, to be washed lord our heavenly father we are your children and you care for us in such a way uh, we are redeemed from an evil conscience that does not see reality as it is but lies about you and who we are and so we 
We thank you for the redemption of our minds and understanding even now that there is a sense in which we are still in living in two worlds. We're living in this old age and the age to come. And so uh, we're prone to be misled and to follow false shepherds and thieves. And so we ask Lord Jesus and Father and Spirit this morning to, to, to get us back on the right track, to lead us back to, uh, to, to waters that will give life rather than broken cisterns that cannot. We pray, Lord, that this morning we would uh, be drawn to your word, to its, its sufficiency for us and for our need of it. And our, as, we, as we consume uh, the word this morning, would it be sweet to our taste? We know that we are incapable of drumming up a taste for your word. So we ask for your grace this morning to, to give us that, which we long for uh, and, and as, as those in Christ, which is to know you and to love you and to bring glory to your name. Lord, we, we pray that you would cause us to be faithful and good servants, uh, faithful and just and, and full of your spirit in all of our ways and dealings with you and with others. We pray, Lord, as we uh, are build a, a church in process of being built, that uh, you've, you've brought so many here to deploy gifts. And so as we, as we consider how we might stir up graces in one another this morning, as we worship you, would you call us to ministries and to, to avenues where we can serve, we pray. Uh, but right now, as we are all gathered in this place, by your sovereign will and your purposes for our lives. Would you speak, we ask that you, would you speak powerfully to us this morning with clarity, uh, with your full of your spirit that we would f- find Christ to be glorious and we'd lift him up. We'd lift up the cross high and say that he has washed us and has sprinkled us with his blood. Lord, we ask that uh, as we uh, hear your word and sing it and pray it and see it ex- uh, exhibited in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, would all these things bring us to Christ and to Him, our Lord. We ask that they would be uh, useful and powerful for your purposes and for your kingdom to go forward and your will to be done in our lives in this, in this city. We pray for us to be a blessing to Norman today uh, as we worship you in this place. Lord, we ask that uh, you would do these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We pray also according to the example you gave your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you will remain standing with me, uh, would you sing with me, Praise to the Lord Almighty, number 53.
be seated. We are going through the Psalms uh, in our readings uh, at the beginning of our service. We like to hear the Word of God and we don't just like to, we think it's a good idea to hear the Word of God and respond. So He reveals who He is and we respond. Uh, he reveals what we are called to do and we respond to that. And we had been going through the Psalms uh, one by one. We're going to skip ahead to Psalm 51 today. And the justification for that is that verse 4 is in the text we're going to read So uh, in, in Romans 3 today. So we're going to get the wider context, and we'll be speaking of that more in the sermon. But I wanted to read this psalm with you, lead you in that. And then we're going to pray a prayer of confession based upon this psalm from the Scottish book of Psalms uh, from 1589. So we're going to pray that as a public confession of sin, then we'll have a private confession of sin, and then we'll hear words of assurance from Micah chapter 7. So follow with me in the psalm lesson this morning. Psalm 51, 1 through 12. This is David's confession after being confronted by the prophet Nathan uh, with his sin of Bathsheba, with Bathsheba and Uriah. Hear the uh, word of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amen. It's a great uh, lesson to be able to have direction on how we are to address God printed in Holy Scripture for us as we consider how to confess our sins and how to seek God's restoration, we we cry out for His work and grace in our lives. So we're going to do that now with a confession of sin. Pray with me, please. Father of all mercies, who delightest not in the death of a sinner, have compassion upon us. Wash us from all our sins we have committed against Thy holy majesty. Since the time we first came into this world, create in us a clean heart and strengthen us continually with thy Holy Spirit, that we, being truly consecrated to thy service, may set forth thy praises through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I want to highlight this Micah 7 passage for you this morning and read it with you. Uh, A couple things you need to know uh, is that he speaks, as we mentioned in our resurrection series, on the forefathers of our faith, Abraham and Jacob, for instance, as as being present tense in relationship with God. His faithfulness, steadfast love to these fathers of old. Uh, They are alive with God in Micah 7. So we're talking hundreds of years before Christ. And, and this idea of forgiveness of sins and how it all works is, is hidden in the Old Testament. It's there. It's revealed further in the New Testament. But look what it says there. He pardons iniquity. And he passes over transgression. He passes over transgressions as he passed over the guilt of the Israel at the uh, Passover. Uh, he doesn't judge it. Where does he judge it? He judges it finally and, and, and 
completely in Christ. It would come after the fullness of time had arose and Christ came in flesh and took on our sin upon his body and it was fully judged. So we have no fear of entering into the presence of God. We enter in boldly to the throne and embrace Christ, our Savior, because he's loved us and forgiven us through his work of atonement on the cross and his resurrection. We are healed and forgiven. So let's, let's read this from Micah 7 and hear these, good, these words of good news from the prophet. It says, who is, like, who, is, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities under a foot. Underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have shown, sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Amen. This next hymn, I want to highlight one thing, just give a little bit of exposition on it. Uh, the, the refrain will end with, He is with us to the end. And I think that when we think of with, we need to think of two things. He is near us, but He's for us, with us, meaning He's advocating for us. He, he relates to us as a friend and advocate. So as you, as you stand and sing with me, be considering the ways that He is with you as a friend this morning. So let's stand.
may be seated. Just had the opportunity to do a wedding last night. Uh, involved vows, and those are amazing because they encapsulate what, what is it we're after here? What are we, what are we trying to accomplish? What's our, what's our mission? And uh, words are very powerful, and, and it would do us well to not gloss over these words that we're so fam- some of us are so familiar with. This Apostles' Creed, it distills down basic Christian doctrine. And we, we can use this as a guide to consider what is it that we are in Christ? What are we doing? What do we believe, actually? And, and we, we believe in history, that God worked in history, and that it meant something. Uh, that, that what, what Jesus accomplished in the center of this accomplishes namely uh, our communion with God, our restoration with Him, forgiveness of our sins, and the resurrection of our own bodies. Because He is our second Adam. He is our first fruits. And ultimately the life everlasting. So that uh, this, this creed, uh, it ends in a, like just a, a deluge of blessings to be grateful for. That we, that we receive by God's grace. And I want you to, to, to say that with me. And I'll ask you, Christian, what is it you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From there, He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a moment and offer up prayer requests this morning. So those should be printed on the next slide ahead of us on the prayer slide. And so I I would commend those to you to something you can... You can uh, write down and, and pray throughout those of the week. Uh, a few uh, new ones that I want to highlight. Uh, down there at the bottom, uh, uh, COVID recovery. Uh, we, we pray for that often here. But, but you know, just, uh, there's a lot involved with COVID recovery. Some of you getting uh, vaccinations, and, and many of you have gotten those. And many of us have had COVID at least once. And, and so we're, we're you know, praying that, uh, that the restrictions uh, in, our, in our world will be let down. But, that businesses can recover and people's lives can be put together again, but but let's not waste this uh, this time. You know, we got to ask that God would would do His work through it. You know, not just that we get back to to what we want to do, but that God would form in us resiliency and endurance, perseverance, and hope uh, as we have endured these things. Not that we'll find ourselves to be more self sufficient, obviously, or independent, but that we would cry out to Him and see His uh, His work in it. So. This is, this is a great, it's a great opportunity in time of suffering to, to be blessed through it. So that's one, one example. Two, uh, Josiah uh, is one of the triplets who were born last week uh, from, by a pastor and his wife up in the uh, uh, Northeast. And just this one guy is still hanging on, uh, Josiah. The other two have, have gone through the Lord. And Josiah actually uh, does mean... And the Hebrew uh, has uh, allusions to healing, and that Yahweh heals. And, and I, I, that's what a great, great uh, name to pray. Pray for Josiah to be healed according to the meaning of that name, and to be uh, restored to health there. So we pray for this baby who is uh, in, in, in critical condition, but we're asking for the Lord to, to bring him uh, out of that and heal him. We pray for, that's Nathan and Kelly Beard. We also want to pray for Adeline, uh, who is the granddaughter of Pa and Sandy, and there's a new uh, a scan coming up this week for, for, for to see if cancer is returning or not returning, or where, where, where we stand there. Uh, Adeline has, has uh, faced treatment for cancer, and, and things are good right now. We pray that that continues on. Is that correct? Yep. And also, um, Jerry uh, does have to have some chemotherapy, so we'll pray for that. For, for, the, uh, for the cancer to go away. Cancer is terrible. Uh, and we also want to think of uh, our uh, uh, Steve Reynolds, who is a minister in the ARP in Canada, and he is facing a trial for holding services uh, that, that do not meet the regulations according to the rules there in the government. So 
praying for a good result for him. So with those things mentioned, let's go to the Lord and pray. And if you and by, by, before we do that, please let us know. It is my pleasure to pray for you and with you and, let, and pray with one another. But let's, let's continue this offering of a prayer request so we can do this uh, together and be blessed through it. So let's pray to the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the sharing of the prayer request this morning that we could uh, know uh, not only one another a little bit better in the struggles that we go through, but to know how you meet us in those things and, and provide for us and, and rejoice together. We, we long for a good report from uh, the Reynoldses up in uh, Canada. We ask for you to, to provide for them and to provide for that church and, and their uh, difficulties pray for uh, uh, your justice to be done, ultimately, and, and uh, that uh, whatever the outcome would be, uh, that uh, there would be great praise for you and your work. But we ask for you to help the church to, to use creative means uh, to worship you and to have fellowship in these times, and we ask that uh, you would bring about, of course, healing for, for COVID and for all those who are afflicted by it and are sick and those who are uh, trying to get, get back to uh, meeting with people in person and doing things out in the world and getting businesses back together and, and starting new ventures and all the things that need to happen. We pray that you would uh, give us wisdom on how to do those things well and, and ways that would glorify you and praise you for, for the opportunities to suffer and to be disoriented because we see in your scriptures and in our own lives how those things have been useful as discipline for us and, and bring us along to be conformed more to the image of your glorious uh, Son, the only Son, Jesus. So we pray that you would make us more like him through all that we endure uh, for your sake, for his sake. We pray, Lord, for these uh, those that are hurting, those that are sick. We praise you for, for bringing us back. We praise you for the way you've worked in Brent's life in, in the last few weeks and getting him back to health, back to work. We pray for, uh, for Jerry as well. Uh, for her treatment for cancer, would it be uh, uh, effective and powerful, uh, and that you give her many, many good days ahead, as these are uh, hard days uh, during chemotherapy. We pray that uh, those days, uh, though they are uh, full of, of illness and, and hurting, that those days would be days where she would cling to you and, and know you as a provider and a friend and, and a redeemer in those times. We pray for that, and we pray for a good result from the treatment. We pray for Adeline, too, and we ask that you would give her uh, a good report. We, we are anxious, and uh, we do so. Uh, we, we are anxious, understanding that all things are in your hands, and, and that you uh, do not give us anything more than what we can bear or what any of us can bear, but you provide perfectly for us as we confess that, but we uh, long for a good report, we want a good report, we desire it, so we lift it up to you and ask for you to bring us uh, the desires of our hearts. So we pray for Sandy and for Todd, for Justin, as they seek to minister to Adeline and her family and her parents and all the uh, brothers and sisters and all that, that, that are they're, uh, wrapped up in this uh, story that you're writing. We pray for, for your uh, work of ministry to, to and through them in this time. We pray for the Beard family, and especially for this little boy, Josiah. We pray for his health, for his wellness, uh, that you would bring him out of the hospital bed and give him uh, a fullness of life so that, that, they, that his parents and all that community and our church could, could rejoice in the meaning of that name, and that you are a healing one. Uh, you do hear our cries and you provide for us as you've done throughout redemptive history and done for us. We, we uh, as a family, pray for children who are sick in our own family and have seen your work in that, uh, and we give you glory for that. Uh, we praise you for this church. We pray that you will build it up, that you will protect it from evil. It would cause us to, to, to despise our sins and, and run to Christ and, and to, to, to feel the, the love that you have for us in a way. But Lord, we know that we are prone to spiritual blindness, so we ask that you open our eyes. We might behold beautiful and wonderful things in your word. As we seek to hear your word this morning, would you speak to us through it, your spirit uh, dwell with us and, and bring us into your presence through your word read this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go now to uh, a time of... Um, Offering, we're not going to offer uh, our, uh, the typical way we are used to in church because of COVID. I say this every week, but I want to remind you, we're not going to pass the plates around, but the pl 
plate. The offering plate is on the back table by all the resources there with books and things like that. It says TPC on it. So if you want to give to the church, you can do a physical offering or you can also do a, um, a electronic offering uh, online through the app that we have. Just look, a church, look up a church for Norman or you can go through the website, trinitynorman.com. There's various different ways to do that. So we're gr- glad and grateful for that. Uh, for all that God's given us, we give back to him because uh, these are his, his, um, uh, his resources ultimately that he's given us a steward. So we give back to him. And in doing so, we want to stand together and sing an offering him called the Gloria Patri. And the word should be printed on the uh, overhead. So let's, let's sing that together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. 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 Maybe see that's not awesome. So as the children are, the children can go ahead and and depart with Miss Stephanie and Dr. Ryan. They have a children's catechism lesson for you today. And you're all invited to, to enjoy that and return back for the last half of the service uh, this morning. Uh, if you're, it's a, good to have a full house again. You know, back to be back to here. We've got a great big room here, so there are extra chairs in the back if you want to spread out. There's there's still potential to do that. There's a few more, so just want to make sure everybody knows that too. If you want to, if you feel a little bit weird about being close to people, you know, that's fine. We want to uh, accommodate that too, so we have a lot of uh, extra chairs in the back that you can get there too. All right, that said, I want to read to you the catechism lesson for today that the kids will be looking at. And so I'll read the question, and then we will read the answer together. It's on page five of our worship guide. And so with that, we're, we'll notice we're looking at the Ten Commandments. The, the kids have been memorizing those and, and going through what they mean. So question 10 says, what does God require in the Fourth and Fifth Commandments? Fourth, that on the Sabbath day, we spend time in public and private worship of God. Rest from routine employment, serve the Lord and others, and so anticipate the eternal Sabbath. Fifth, that we love and honor our father and mother, submitting to their godly discipline and direction. All right, that's what they're learning right now. I know the parents are grateful for that one. So, all right. let's, uh, let's get to the Word of God this morning from Romans 3, 1 through 8. So if you'll turn with me in your copies of God's Word. To Romans 3, 1 through 8. And if you will stand with me for the reading of God's word and reverence of it. Hear the word of the Lord. Then what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness, or does, does their faithfulness, uh, faithlessness, sorry, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why, do not, evil, why, and why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This morning, that might be one of the least clear uh, passages of what we're talking about just from no context. And so I want to give you a little bit of a recap into what, we're, what we've been going through in the book of Romans and the, 
the, the epistle to the Romans, the letter to the Romans, is essentially focusing in on one doctrine and its life-changing implications. And it's written to a community, a church that is in Rome, that initially began as Jewish, primarily ethnically converts to the Christian faith. And we think that's true because in Acts 2, uh, when Peter was preaching and the Holy Spirit descends upon the church in Jerusalem, some of them were from Rome and they go back to Rome and begin a church there. And then Paul, who had never been there, is writing saying, hey, I want to come to you. Now, a church that began as primarily Jewish did not stay that way. Uh, as one of the leaders, uh, one of the, uh, the, the governing authorities there uh, expunged, he kicked out all of the Jewish believers uh, from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the city. And so then uh, the gospel kept going forward and, and most of the church leaders and, and uh, primarily the church there was Gentile, meaning non-Jewish. And these Gentiles and uh, kind, of, kind of took over and those were the leaders now. And so I think if you w went away for COVID and, and came back a year later and all the people were different in the church, right? So how would the, how would the dynamics be of that? You know, uh, you know, think about that. These are people who are exiled and they're back again. So they're trying to figure out how to live together again uh, because the people did return eventually. The, the original leaders of the church returned and the families. And so they're all, they're all working together uh, in the church. And so Paul has some of those things in view as he's teaching this doctrine and he's taught and, that, and so there's all these questions about how do we relate to God how are we justified with God meaning declared to be righteous when we think about justification God righteouses us through faith in Christ he declares us to be righteous through the work of Christ for us meaning his death for us on the cross his resurrection and also his life of obedience that he kept the law of God for us. So as Paul has made a case, we're all under sin, whether you're Gentile or Jew. He's been making that case the first two, we, or two, two chapters, and we just finished chapter two last time. And, and, and you know, I think of like chapter two as like a, an army crawl through the mud. We're just like, we're trying to get out of, the, out of these two chapters in a lot of ways because at 321, it gets to be really amazing. We get to, to freedom through Christ and, and a righteousness revealed through faith. But if we're not clear about the journey of how we got there, there's some pitfalls we can fall into. And so you're going to see a lot of uh, questions that he's going to bring up in this text. Essentially, he's made the case that there is no advantage that the people have uh, who have had the Jewish religion, meaning they, they, they knew the Old Testament. Now, he says that there's no advantage for them as meaning immunity from God's judgment. If they're sinners, they will still be judged for their sins if they are not in Christ. And so you might think, well, what is, if that doesn't do me any good, it doesn't have any value for me. I mean, you might be pragmatist here and think, well, that's not, like, why do we even care about this Jewish religion or the Old Testament even if it doesn't have any value for me to save me? And, and you think about like, the things that we look at, things that don't save us, we tend to think, well, that doesn't do anything for me. Well, Paul's going to make the case that it actually does do something for you. There is an extreme advantage in their history. So none of us in this room should ever despise our heritage or what, where we came from. You might think, well, I wish I would have had you know, her upbringing or his upbringing or, or what they had. You know? and, and, but it's kind of fair that I didn't have that. What you've been given in your family, your birth, your, your, what you've been taught, those things are in God's design for you. We know that everything that He does, everything that happens in our lives is according to His providence. And that He has been moving us along by His perfect plan and He's writing a better book than we could ever write. A better plan. He has a better plan than we could ever enact and come up with. So as you're thinking about this, we can have a lot of really bad ideas if we don't think God's thoughts after him when we think about these things. So he says the principal advantage for you if you've been raised in a religious home, if you've been raised in the Jewish faith even with the Old Testament taught, is that you have in verse 2 the oracles of God. When he says is there much in verse 1 is there value in circumcision or is there value in being a Jew? Circumcision and Jew were kind of uh, 
synonyms, you think about the circumcised as the Jews, right? So, so is there value in that? Yes, much in every way. To begin with, they're entrusted with the oracles of God. Now, the oracles of God, that's the special revelation from God. Now, we know that God makes his, his glories known in the works of all of creation. We look at the, the complexities of an eyeball and the, and, and the glories of the stars and the skies and the mountains and the seas and, and all that God's made and ordered in this world. You think about those things, the small and the great. God pours forth speech. He declares his handiwork and his glory, right? So some of us see that, some of us suppress that, right? But we should all see it. The thing that the Jewish people had was the oracles of God, meaning the special revelation, audible, verbal, written down words about not only the acts of God, but the nature of God, who he is. Because we can have a lot of ideas about who God is, but the Bible itself, the Old Testament, tells us without error sufficiently who God is, what he's like. And so to know what God's like is their distinct advantage. And primarily the thing he wants to highlight is that God is a faithful God. You might think that he's not faithful because what? Well, all these people didn't believe. All these people were were rejecting him. And what is up with that? But Paul's answer to them is essentially, have you read the Bible? Have you read the Bible? If you're reading the Bible with understanding, you will know what God's like and you will put these bad ideas to bed and you'll thank God's thoughts after him. It's a great advantage to have the Bible, to have the word of God revealed to you. Now, there's a story called uh, The Emperor's New Clothes. Have any of you all read this? Uh, it's, it's a, a lot of people talk about this story. I've never actually read it, but I've heard it said millions of times. You know, it's like this, this story about an emperor, and he's a vain guy, and he wants the best clothing, and so he hires these uh, philosophers to weave him a rare and costly garment. You know, they, like they, they, they've offered him this you know, rare and costly garment, right? And so he, he liked that the garment, this, this thing, is gonna, it's going to be invisible to all but the wise and pure in heart. So if you can see this thing, you've got a leg up on everybody else, right? It's invisible to only the wise and the pure in heart. So they can see it, right? So the emperor commissions them to make this clothing, and they, he pays them just an exorbitant amount of money to do this. And the con men get there with empty looms to weave together the clothes for the emperor. They pretend to be weaving. So he sends his chief minister to go check it out, and the guy that gets there to see what they're doing and what it looks like, we can't see it. So he lies about seeing it, right? And he tells them, well, you know, look, it's, it's amazing. You won't believe it, emperor. Yeah, so... The, the chief minister lies because he doesn't want to be thought of as somebody who's not wise and impure of heart, right? So he, he lies. Well, then eventually they ask for more money. The, the con men ask for money. And so the emperor himself wants to go see it himself and see what am I paying for here? And to his chagrin, he can't see the thing either. So what does he do? He lies about it. He's like, oh, yes, this is great. Yes, this is wonderful. He pays him more money you know, to, to keep the thing going, right? Well, the emperor goes he doesn't see anything uh he doesn't want to appear stupid so he's going to go along with this thing unwittingly and then they then they finally finish and they clothe him and he's naked (laughs) and he doesn't have any clothes on and and so he's walking so then he's like he's going to parade his new clothes to the to his subjects and, and, expl- and everyone explains, here's what he's doing, guys. He, he's, he, so he goes out and parades, and he is nude. Uh, and, uh, and everyone kind of goes along with it. Oh, yes, the emperor, yes, look at his new clothes. Everyone's totally blind. I mean, like, he's naked. Finally, a child says, hey, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. And then the re- emperor realizes, oh, I've been caught. I'm naked. It's like, uh, it's like, it's an embarrassing moment. In his pride, he was unwilling to see uh, and confess that he wasn't wise. He wasn't pure. And he was, uh, you know, because that would be the implication of his saying he couldn't see the clothing. And in doing so, he was conned. He believed something very terrible. And Paul wants to rescue us from believing something very terrible here. Namely, that God's not faithful. Uh, namely, that God won't judge sins, and also that we should take sin lightly. Uh, he wants to, to rescue us from those bad ideas. 
And we see those in the objections. When he, he uses the word in verse uh, three or verse four, uh, the word translated by no means. And this is his most emphatic, no, never think that in the Greek. Never think that. No, that would be horrible to think that. So the, the answer here is what if some were unfaithful, does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? Never believe that God is not faithful. He's faithful. God is faithful. Don't you know from the oracles of God that God is faithful? That's the question there. And so he's faithful. And if he's not faithful, you know, we can punt on. We can you know, lose. Well, we're still lost in our sins. He won't, he, he, he won't, he won't save us from our sins. You know, that's a, that's a really bad thing. If God's not faithful and we're faithless, well, why are we going to be saved from our sins? How we have any assurance that we can ever be saved if God's not faithful? You know why, why we're saved? Because God made promises to Abraham. And he ensured those promises by swearing by himself. There's no other thing under, under heaven to, to, to assure them that God's going to keep his word, but God himself. He says, if I break my promises, I should die. He made a covenant with them. And he exhibited that covenant in Genesis 15. And that covenant is everything. That God says, I'm going to keep my word, is everything. He is faithful. This is wrapped up in who he is. He's faithful. Now, Paul is going to say, by no means, and he's going to appeal to the Scripture in verse 4. And so that first thing, he's going to save people from their sins. If we lose the faithfulness of God, if we, don't, if we ignore the oracles of God, which we should be utilizing as, as, as church people here, we're going to lose this assurance that God will save us from our sins. So he's going to quote Psalm 51, 4. And, he's going to, and it says there, it's, it's, uh, it's brought out and, and highlights in your, in your Bibles. It says, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you judge. If you turn back uh, a, a page in your worship guide, the whole context is there uh, to this psalm. And it says there, uh, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. This is David writing. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. As he's considering the sin that he did, he confesses, I've sinned against you. That's going to come up later. But think about that. But he says there, behold, in verse 5, after this, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. He's in sin. Sin is at the core of his identity. He was born into it. And next week we're going to look at just what that means to be under sin or in sin. In, in verses 9 through 20, as, as, God, as God gives us a litany of verses, a chain of verses to back this up. But he's in sin. Right? But it says, you delight in truth and you teach me wisdom. So David knows his sin and he rests upon the faithfulness of God towards him in spite of his faithlessness. He confesses his sin and he rests in the promises that God has given him, namely that you are his, his king, David, and you will have a throne. It will go in forever. And, and, and God has revealed to him, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. As we saw in Psalm 16. There's numerous direct revelation from God to David to assure him that God would be faithful to him even when he is faithless to him. And so in light of his sin, we have a great example where he says, okay, understanding the faithfulness of God and I deserve hell, please purge me, cleanse me, wash me, let me have the joy of my salvation back again through your work and faithful work of changing me within. You see that he's confessing his sin out of the assurance of the faithfulness of God. Now, if we don't know that God's faithful to his words, what are we going to not do? We're not going to pray. We're going to ignore our sin and we're going to try to justify ourselves based upon our works. Right? Because if, it's, if it has something to do with me, then I have to look to what I've done and claim salvation through that. 
We have this idea that the things that, that we have in our world will save us. And I, I spoke at a wedding last night where I said at the outset, marriage will not save you. It will not transform you in any way, any way apart from God's grace. It's not going to change you. If you're a sinner going in, you're going to be a sinner going out. Uh, you're not going to lose all these sins just because you simply are married now. You know, or, you know, or you're baptized. Oh, well, I've been sinning a lot. I've got to get baptized again or something like that. Like the idea that I could do something that's going to change me. The only thing that's going to change me or my status is God's grace. God's work in my life and being faithful to His promises. I can count nothing else as sufficient to change me. God's faithfulness changes me and restores me. I have no hope but in God's Word faithfully kept by Him. And that's what David said. And that's why Paul appeals to David and says, look back to David. Don't you know David? Let's talk about David. If you have your Bibles, go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. What does he do? Well, when kings are supposed to be going out to war, he doesn't go out to war. He sees a, a woman bathing, and he arose and says, I want that woman. That's a beautiful woman. David, in verse 11, 3, it says he sent and acquire, and, and to inquire about that woman. The people tell him, that's somebody else's wife. That's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Who is Uriah? Uriah is the Hittite. Uriah is a faithful servant to David. Uriah is a soldier in David's army. So David sends, after he, after he sends for Bathsheba, takes her as, as his own. He takes Uriah's wife and has her. Well, then she conceives. And so he sends her back. She's pregnant, she says to David. And now David is found out that his sin of taking Uriah's wife will be found out. So what he does is he sends Uriah back from, from out fighting. He says, come on, get, bring Uriah back. Uriah comes back home. And Uriah, what David's plan is, is to get Uriah, the, wife, or the, the husband of Bathsheba, to sleep with his wife so they can cover up their tracks. And that the baby can be thought to be Uriah's baby. So David has an affair with this man's wife and wants to cover it up by sending the man back to sleep with his wife. Uriah, ironically, will not comply with David's desire. The story goes that Uriah will sleep outside the palace because he does not want to take advantages that his uh, comrades, his fellow soldiers, are unwilling, are, are not are not. Uh, not able to partake in as well, like being able to go to their homes and be with their wife. So, so that's what, uh, the, the plan is foiled. And, and Uriah, David cannot convince Uriah to just go and be with his wife and, win, and, and cover his tracks. So what does he do? He comes up with another plan. The next plan is to send Uriah to the front lines of battle and, 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 and he instructs his commanding officer to do so, to send him at the lead of the battle and then to withdraw so that he's surely killed. And that plan is effective for David's vindication, so to speak. He has, the, he has Bathsheba's wife, or Bathsheba's husband, murdered. And that is the end of Uriah, you think. Well, David is, is cleansed, his, cleansed his hands of his sin and he's fine. He's got, he takes Bathsheba to be his own. And this seems to be a great ending for him, right? So he kind of forgets about all that. Chapter 12 comes up in 2 Samuel 12. So the Lord sends a prophet to David, Nathan. And David is approached by this prophet, Nathan, and, and he tells him a story. He says, there were two men, this is chapter 12, verse 1, there were two men in that certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing. But one little ewe lamb, which he had which he'd bought. And, and he brought it up and grew it up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. He, they loved this sheep, right? They loved the lamb. Um, and now, now there came a traveler to the rich man 
and, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him and uh, practice hospitality. So what he did was he took the poor man's lamb, the one that they loved, and then he killed it and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So he takes and steals the man's only like prized possession and uses it for his benefit. It says, verse 5, David's anger was greatly kindled against that man in the story. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who's done this deserves to die. And he shall, rest and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing. That's horrible. Because he had no pity on him. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. He says, I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Gave you your master's house, your master's wives, and your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If this were too little, I would add to you as much more. How, how piercing is that? If you didn't have enough, I would have given you more. All you had to do was ask. I've given you so much, and you took what's not yours. You're the man. You stole this man's wife. David, verse 13, says, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. It's faithful. Nevertheless, because of this deed, you've utterly scorned the Lord. The child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. And the rest of the story, the child dies. You know, the sin had consequences. Terrible consequences. But it's Nathan, the prophet, tells him, the Lord's put away your sins. He's been faithful to you. If you were to ask, he would have given you so much more. He's faithful. You're his, he's yours. He's with you. Consider that relational dynamic. And that's not just for David. That's for any child of God. Anyone who is in his family by adoption through the blood of Christ and through the, the declaration of God. This is true of all of us. If it... If it were more than you needed, just ask. Don't seek to go out and get it yourself. God will provide. The faithfulness of God, He will save His people from His sins, from their sins. He does it. He promises David right here in the midst of judging him, says, He's put away your sins. Nonetheless, it has consequences. So the, so the, the oracles of God here reveal uh, also that God will judge sins. As you think about that, the second part here, the faithfulness of God is exhibited in his judgment of sins. Look at verse 5. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? So he's saying here, look, you know, they're thinking, you know, like, well, if, if, you know, you've been saying, Paul, that righteousness is through faith alone and not through my mix of works or anything I do, right? So if that's the case, then if my unrighteousness and my sin are just more for God to forgive, then why shouldn't I just sin more? All right? That, that I should you know, be able to do more sin so that God might get more glory. Right? Because I'm a bigger trophy. Right? I'm like a bigger buck. You know, he, he's got, I've got all this sin. You know, all these horns on my head. And, and God is able to overcome those things. Right? So why don't I... Uh, sin more. If our righteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what should we say? First thing he says there is that, that God's unrighteous to inflict wrath on us. That's the first objection. So, uh, is God, if, if that's true, if my unrighteousness makes God look better, then he's unrighteous to inflict wrath on me. He's unrighteous to judge me because I'm just making him more glorious through my sin. What a wicked argument. Hey, hey, you're naked. You know that? You know you're naked? Have you seen what you're saying? You haven't read anything. Did you know that the day of the Lord will come with judgment upon all the nations? He's going to judge the world. Have you forgotten this part? Like the day of the Lord is coming. You should be afraid of this. Because God will take every sin and account for it either in His Son or on all of us. There's no escape from God's justice. God is faithful, which means He's just. He will judge sin. If it were the case that my sin only helps, then God would be 
unrighteous for judging sin. Sin doesn't help. Sin harms. Alright, so I'm going to move on to the third point now. The oracles of God reveal that God never sanctions our evil acts. You can never use that, that logic of, the, well, the means justify the ends. I can sin that, that good may come. No, I can never say that. I should never sin that good, that, to think, that, oh, a good result came out of it. Well, so then I'm justified in that. So the, the, the situation here is that God, that's absurd. Like, look at this. Even the story of David shows that. Yeah, so God forgave David, but we might think, well, my sin, you know, even though I'm justified, I can sin because, I mean, especially the sins that no one knows about, right? No, sin is against God's revealed will, and it destroys. Even if you can't see how it's destroying you, it's killing you. And it, it will destroy you, it will harden you to sin. Its deceitfulness will destroy your love and your communion for God. It is toxic. Why should we, why should we sleep next to a snake that wants to bite us and poison us? It's toxic. Why would we get close to that? Uh, in, in teaching uh, youth, you know, sometimes people want to know, well, in dating, how far is too far? What is the line? <laughs> so, like, why would you want to go? Why would you want to ask that question? What are you trying to get away? What are you trying to get away with? What do you want to like? What do you? What is the line that's too close to sin that I'm going to hit that and go over that? Uh, that's the wrong question. We ought to always, as Christians, be like, I want to be holy because God's holy. Have we not read the oracles of God? God is holy, and we are called to be holy. We're called to be set apart. And so, if we've heard the doctrine of justification by faith alone through Christ alone by God's grace. And we think that that means, well, I should just take sin lightly. We have missed everything. We don't understand. Our sin is what put Christ on the cross. God despises sin. Why? Because it not only is offense to God, but it destroys you. It destroyed Bathsheba. Bathsheba carried that baby who died because of the sin. David, don't ever think your sin has no impact and it actually is a good thing it's a wicked thing it's a wicked thing now you're naked you're naked you might think of this um, this this uh this painting that's uh, the next uh, slide on the on the uh on the on powerpoint there it's a painting from rembrandt famous payment painting you know it's a it's called the night watch and, and it was famous because it had such good dark and light uh, imagery that the light really brought out the dark and the dark brought out the light. It's the idea there. So you might think, well, my darkness brings out the light. Well, yeah, but I don't, I don't get any glory in that. What, what, the only place where sin gets glory is at the cross. The cross. God ordained the wicked actions of man to kill the innocent son for the salvation of you, the world. Jew and Gentile, all of us coming to the table of the Lord by the grace of God through his faithful keeping of his word that he would pardon our sins. He'd pass over their sins till the time appointed where the Lamb of God would come. As we've mentioned in the past in the series that the, the big the big question throughout the whole Old Testament is where's the lamb? God's been promising this lamb since Genesis 3 as he slaughters a lamb, uh, an animal, and covers the naked, ashamed first parents with garments. One day we're going to trade our sinful selves for garments of Christ's robes of righteousness. We'll be white, washed. The sins of scarlet will be forgiven, washed forevermore by the blood of Christ. That is a true reality for all those who are in Christ because he's risen. He paid the penalty. He lived the life we couldn't live. And God accepted it. And he is justified in his resurrection. And he is declared to be the son of God in power, as Romans 1.4 says. And he is set apart as this mediator between God and man. 
for us. He's sanctified and he is glorified. He's reigning now and he will be even more so when he comes and judges all enemies and brings all the all those people out of the graves to dwell in the new heaven and new earth. Now the thing is, these things have nothing to do with your marriage, your baptism, your good works, anything that you have here, your faithfulness, you, you exhibit faithfulness because the Spirit works in you to be faithful. And we can pray to God and ask Him to change us because He's able to do so. But the Emperor's new clothes is our story. If we, if we ever want to think that God's not faithful, or if we ever want to think that God won't judge the world for its sin, or we ever want to think that our sin does good, good things, we are dangerous. Dangerous if that's true. I saw a story this week of someone on one of the neighborhood Facebook pages had dropped 3,000 nails unwittingly in this neighborhood. You know what happened? A lot of pop tires. <laughs> it's a good week for being in the tire business. He had no idea this was happening, right? Obviously, right? So, no one's going to nefariously go out and drop nails all over the streets, right? No one would do that. But your ignorance to what you're doing doesn't excuse it, right? It's still an evil thing that happened. These people's tires got popped, right? Don't walk around oblivious thinking, I know who God is. I know, I know what He's like. How do you know? I'll never forget, I was at a Chamber of Commerce meeting one time. And you know, I'm the pastor in the room and people want to run things by me sometimes because I'm the, uh, the, the holy man. And <laughs> I say it jokingly, the holy man. Uh, but I'm a sinner like everyone else. Here's the thing though. Uh, someone was telling me a story and they said, that's such a God thing. And the person looked at me and said, wait, is that a God thing? <laughs> and I'm like, what a, what a thing to say. Is, that's a God thing. But then in the next sentence, to think, wait, wait a minute, I have no idea who He is. Like, we live in a culture where we, where we have these ideas of who God is. And how do you know that what you're believing is not some fake garment and you're naked? How do you know? The oracles of God tell you. The Word of God tells you. You can know that you know what God's like by reading the oracles of God and Him blessing it. He can change your, your knowing of Him into accurate, true, and good. You can comprehend and, and know, apprehend who He is if you study the oracles of God and you pray and ask Him to help you and change you. You know why? Because it tells us so. He's faithful. As David said, wash me, purge me, create me a clean heart. He did it. He does it. Hey, we're all in process. We won't be full and complete until the new heaven and new earth in the final day. But God's at work in us, producing what? Fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. God's faithful. We're created to be like Him. We're going to be faithful. We are going to be faithful. Because God is going to produce that in us. And part of that faithfulness is, going to, is we're going to look at it the longer we go, and we're going to look and we're going to say, man, I wish I was more faithful. You know why? Because we're coming, we're, we're coming more to the presence of Christ. We're seeing His holiness and His faithfulness. And we're knowing Him. We're knowing our sin even more. And we're, we're drawn to our knees. Make me more holy. Make me more faithful. Help me, Lord. Because we're seeing Him as He truly is through the oracles of God. You want to derail and, and, and destroy your life? Don't listen to the oracles of God. The oracles of God, the Scriptures, the church, is one of your best resources, of course, to know the Lord. Uh, drink deeply of who He is. Know Him. Okay, with that said, you and I should have learned better. We all should have learned better. We should know the, we, we, we haven't been faithful to what we've been given. The oracles of God, we, we could all look at, 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 at uh, 3, 1 through 8 and say, well, I'm in the bad group, right? I'm one of the guys, like, I should know better. I've thought a lot of terrible things and wrong things. But don't miss the Gospel. It's your righteousness is in Christ, not in doing everything perfectly, right? He did it perfectly for you. He is your righteousness. And so think the thoughts of God after Him. Don't craft your own and theologize based on outside influences here. Let the Word of God 
give you uh, who he is and what he's like and what he's going to do and know what, know what a God thing is, in fact. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Oh, God in heaven, we ask that this morning you would give us uh, truth from your word and your, and your sacraments this morning. Uh, we ask that you would give us uh, these things and, and write them on our hearts. Uh, make us uh, a faithful people uh, who would glorify you by your grace. Lord, we ask that your spirit would, would dwell in us and bring us into communion with the Father and the Son and with one another, that we might be transformed and new and full of love for you. Because uh, we know this is not how we were made. We were, we were conceived in sin, as David confessed. And our sin is against not only our brothers and sisters here, but against you. And so we praise, praise you for, for pardoning our sins. We ask that you transform us as we have these aha moments that we are, we are wicked and in need of, sin, of, of ch- transformation. Uh, though you've committed to us, we continue to, to struggle to be faithful to you. So we pray that you would bind our wandering hearts to you once more. And lead us to new life in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, uh, as we go to, gather to the Lord's table, uh, to the Word of God, we're going to have a moment uh, where we will dismiss you to the back of the room to get the elements and return your seats and we'll partake them together. That's the, that's the way we have to work. And, and while we're doing that, the musicians will come forward and, and lead us in a song this morning. Uh, it's going to be. Uh, I forgot what it was. Yes, exactly. And so, with that said, uh, if you want to know what God's like, uh, one way He's given us is the Word and the visible words. When I see the visible words, we're talking about the baptisms and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is the transformation of the Passover meal. The Passover meal is where Christ gathered to the, the, the Passover. And this is to be, it's to be celebrated. God says, do this again. Like, keep on doing this. And so for them to not do it anymore, for you and me not to do it anymore, I means something that will have change. Jesus took the Saturday, the Passover there, the night before he was betrayed, and he, and he changes it and says, it's about the death of Christ. He's the Lamb that comes. All right? So he said, so he's saying, we're going to do this now. We're not going to, Offer up these burnt offerings and and, and you know smear like some of the smearing the blood story. No, no, we are washed by the blood of the Lamb. So if you are washed by the blood of the Lamb, then you are cleansed. You are uh, you have no more sin against you because it was all placed upon Christ and He was judged for it. And his body and his blood was poured out for your sins. Uh, then and, and He has declared you to be righteous through faith. Then you should celebrate this. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a picturing of what was accomplished for you. It's done. It's finished. But if this is not for you, it's not finished. Uh, if you're not a believer in Christ, it is not finished. You're still in, ju- in danger of the judgment of God for your sins. And just simply taking this bread and eating and drinking this wine would just make you more guilty because you lie. You lie who you are. So if, if your faith is in Jesus, take this. Repent of your sins. Take this and say, Christ is my righteousness. I eat and drink him or I perish. Now, if you are not in him, don't take this. Believe in Jesus and you shall be saved, though. You can believe in him today and be saved. This is the gospel. Because it's about what Christ has done for our sins, not what we do for our sins. Faith means we do nothing to receive what Christ has done. And that's what this is about. His body and blood are our righteousness. So with that said, let me pray as we begin to take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray again. Our God, as we meet for a meal, we pray that you would bless these elements, that the bread and the wine, not being transformed, but truly what they are, would lift up our hearts to the whole, to Christ, to look on Him as our faithful one, who kept his word to his people to forgive their sins, to pardon them, and that we are numbered among them, whether we're Jew or Gentile, we understand it. These things do not determine our standing with you, but the work of Christ, our Redeemer, determines our standing with you. And where we stand in relation to it, are we trusting in it? 
Are we looking to it? Are we resting in it? Are we not? Lord, as, we, as, as you make these things clear to us through the things that we see, the things that we taste, the things that we smell, and what we handle with our hands, as you visibly portray this gospel, we pray that you would speak to us and your spirit would, would, would enlighten our minds into the, into the beautiful truths of your gospel. May we never misrepresent you in those ways when we're talking about justification, and, we not, and may we not represent you falsely in our lives. Lord, may we be faithful to you as you've been faithful to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took bread and broke it. So this is my body, broken for you. Take it. Look at that cross. After the bread, he took the wine and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Pouring out from the of sins, take and drink all of them. As often as you do this, you play my death, and thought, come again. At this time, I'll dismiss you to, to get the elements and return to the text to your seats, and we'll sing this key down with this song again.
Just a few words before we finish with our final song. I want to highlight two things. We pray that this will be a church that the gospel builds, that the Holy Spirit builds the work of the good news. And, and we want this to be a place that you love to be and, and, and excited about. We want this to be a church that you want to, you want to serve and want to grow and, and build. So one way we want to do that is through uh, this ministry interest form that uh, Todd has put together online. And uh, those of you who have filled that out already, we give you uh, a lot of praise for that. We know you're very organized and on top of things. Some of us haven't filled it out yet. So we ask that if you haven't filled it out yet, please do so, uh, so that we can have the best data we can to start uh, uh, filling up these teams to serve in the ways that, that need to, to happen with our church as it grows in the next phase uh, to become an organized church. So that's a great thing, a great way to serve the church is to fill it out, no matter if you're a, a member, um, you know, visitor, or regular attender, whatever you want to do, we'd love to have that information from you about your interest. It takes about two minutes. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to highlight today, too, there's a, you can read all the other stuff on the announcements, but... But, uh, well, two things. Black Mesa, Wednesday, ten, uh, Wednesday at 5.30 is going to be our, our weekly fellowship after work. Black Mesa, 5.30 on Wednesday. And two, the women's uh, Bible study is starting again this week, right? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah, 29th. Okay, got, got it. It's coming up next week. I was jumping the gun. So you've got one more week to get the curriculum or the Bible study guide, which is by Nancy Guthrie. It's called The Lamb of God. Yep. Exodus through Deuteronomy. Great study. So please get on that, ladies. Uh, not just Wait, ladies. Can I ask you that? Yes, ma'am. So our, our Wednesday night group has been meeting on Zoom, but now we're going to kind of do a hybrid, simultaneous Zoom and or in person. Wow. So um, if you want to come on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock mm -hmm. to my house and sit on my back patio, we'll do that. And then if you still want to Zoom, we're going to Zoom from the back patio. So. Um, That's super cool. Let me know if you're interested in that. And if you weren't part of it last time, we're starting a new book. So join in anytime. This is a good time to start. Innovative, yes, innovative, yes. So it's a great time to start. You know, it, it, God, God builds those groups up and, and creates dynamics in them. So if you want to invite somebody, it's a good time to do that too, to, to start a new thing. So it's a good thing. All right, so that's good. Um, with that said, August 22nd is when we start our new season. So we'll be having more, uh, more details about that coming up, but we want to think about how we relate to this city, and it's a university town. We want to think about ministry seasons, uh, and as the, as the university and school starts back August 22nd there, that's going to be our new season of ministry, but then obviously you've got to keep September 19th on your calendar because that's when we're going to have Presbytery visit here and create in us, uh, a, a, you know, anoint us and say, hey, you're an official church now. You're a mission. You're not a mission anymore. You're going to be a particular church, and we'll have our elders ordained at that service too, so it'll be exciting. So that's the plan. So with that said, let's stand and, and sing one more song about God's faithfulness.
Amen. God has been faithful to forgive us of our sins and defeat the devil. Now the devil is defeated, but he's not yet crushed. So hear the benediction. Listen to this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to sing the doxology. Is God from whom all blessings flow? Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy.